Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out this fine Monday evening. We appreciate you being here. My name is Katie Walsh, and I'm one of the co-editors and chiefs of the Davidsonian, our campus's newspaper, and I have the absolute pleasure of introducing tonight's two guests. Our two guests this evening share a few things in common, not the least of which is that they have both influenced how Washington and the media work. And they, or their publications rather, both have been the subject of tweets by, the pres by President Trump that were, to use the president's preferred word, nasty. <laughs> This semester, Bill Crystal has migrated from Washington to a perhaps less politically involved locale. He is Davidson's current visiting Van Professor of Ethics and Society, trading the halls of the White House for the corridors of the Chambers Building. Dr. Crystal, let me assure you that President Quillen's tweets are slightly different from the ones in Washington. Bill grew up in New York and received his bachelor's and doctoral degrees from Harvard. He taught at both Harvard and Penn, served as chief of staff to the Secretary of Education and the Vice President of the United States, and, fo and founded the conservative weekly Standard magazine. His opposition to candidate and President Trump has earned him something of an exile from conservatives and Republicans. So Davidson, North Carolina may be even more appealing to him right now than you may think. <laughs> Bill will be interviewing and offering observations with Mike Allen, co-founder of Axios, a news outlet launched only two years ago, but has proven a juggernaut in the media world with its smart brevity and bombshell scoops, one of which prompted President Trump to tweet of Axios, whatever that is. <laughs> Mike tells us the staff now have t-shirts emblazoned with that phrase. I think I'd like one. Mike is a native of Southern California, graduated from Washington and Lee University, and rapidly worked his way up in the journalism world, eventually writing for Time Magazine, The Washington Post, and New York Times. One theory is that Mike ran out of prestigious news organizations to work for, so he had to start a new one. He was a co-founder of Politico, a primarily online watchdog of Washington, and disrupted the news landscape and fundamentally changed how Washington interacts with the media. Somewhere in the Internet Archives, there is a video of a live, nationally televised press conference, possibly the first where Politico was represented. And in this video, former President George W. Bush calls on Mike to ask a question. But before Mike can pose his query, he became perhaps the first reporter in history to have the president preempt him by asking, Mike, who do you work for now? <laughs> a few years later, after his Politico Playbook newsletter became a job-sustaining diet in Washington, the New York Times Magazine put Mike on the cover and tagged him as the man the White House wakes up to. A decade after helping start Politico, he co-founded Axios, launching at the same time as the Trump administration. You can decide which has been more beneficial. He traded the playbook for Axios at AM. And in a January article in 2018 uh, made by BuzzFeed, Mike offered this observation about his role at Axios, which in case you're wondering means worthy in Greek. The quote reads in the BuzzFeed article, around Washington, Allen is still known for his playbook persona, a cheerful insider comfortable with all the swamp politics people claim to hate about Washington. But at Axios, something seems to have changed about Allen's way of doing things. A dissonance now appears regularly in his newsletter as the political press trudges through whatever wild thing Trump just did or said. Some days, Allen reports the kind of outrageous things he might not have before, like Sean Spicer threatening to call the authorities on him. And some days, Axios AM takes on a so sober moral tone. This isn't normal, Allen wrote this summer. We should never lose sight that we are experiencing a daily display of unprecedented actions and behaviors. With that being said, please welcome Mike Allen and Bill Crystal to the stage. Went out for a run in my whatever that is T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, whatever is that? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Katie, and it's great to be here. I uh, speak for both of us in saying that, and uh, I get to come here every Monday and uh, teach a seminar, which has been terrific and learning a lot. Maybe teaching a tiny bit. Um, and Mike's uh, was really kind to come down. He's an awfully busy guy. He's done. How, he, he does a newsletter now. How, how many years have you done it? 365 days a year. 13 years. And so, a wake up. Yeah, and it comes into your mailbox, your email, your your inbox at six-ish. 
It's totally nuts, basically. But <laughs> um, anyway, it's good to be here. Let me. I thought we'd talk a little bit about the media, uh, which Mike has been such a key participant in and has thought a lot about the transformations in the media, and then about a transformations in politics. It does seem like it's an interesting, unusual moment, as you, Katie quoted you saying, actually. And uh, worth, there's so many things going on in the world, automation, globalization, cultural changes, but the two I suppose we know the most about are the ways in which those all affect and get reflected in uh, the media and politics. So let's talk about media. You began as a reporter at a good old-fashioned local paper, is that right? Yeah, so there's only a few people here who will ever have heard of this, but there used to be something called an evening paper. And, and I it was, was like on print. It was on a paper. It was on print, right? I, <laughs> Threw it in your driveway. It was crazy business model. Will never work. <laughs> Worked for a while, but then unfortunately not so much. So tell, talk about, I mean, so tell a little bit about Axios. I think people may not know as much about it. It's amazing. Matt, my, um, Mike sends out a 6 a.m. Uh, excellent newsletter, which goes to how many people? Uh, Hopefully everyone in this room after tonight. <laughs> Sign up .axios.com. Sign up .axios.com. How many people get it? Uh, about a half million. Half a million people get his newsletter every morning. And how many, what's the open rate as we say in the business? So the open rate is 40%, which doesn't sound great until you no, know the huge. industry average is like 12. So uh, we're fortunate that we have an audience that we really care about and we make sure that we engage them and keep them coming back. So we don't go for numbers, we go for people who are gonna care, people who are gonna be served by what we have. I mean, it's worth just saying a minute how amazing that is. So 200,000 people open, presumably therefore read his newsletter each morning. The New York Times now has, I think, maybe 1.2, 1.4 million subscribers, but in the old days had maybe a million. Uh, but it, studies showed, editors and publishers didn't like to talk about this much, that the actual you know, some people were getting it for the sports section, some people were getting it for business, some people were getting it for the news. So an actual article in the New York Times was often read by a fifth or a quarter of their readers. I know the journal, for example, the editorial page, they did a study, was read by 13% of their readers at one point. So 200, so they were getting, in effect, I mean, one thinks of the New York Times, the journal, huge readership, but your, the readership of your newsletter, of your daily newsletter, is about the same probably as the readership of a, you know, certainly maybe not a front page, but an inner page article, in major article in the New York Times. Well, of course, what the journal editorial page would say is, it's the right 13%. <laughs> so talk a little bit about the transformation. You began at an yeah, evening thanks. print paper, and now you're a key player in this very modern two-year-old experiment, having been a key player in, in the founding of Politico, which was itself a very important moment. So talk a little bit the transformation of the media and where it's going and so forth. Uh, terrific, thank you. And before we plunge in, I just wanted to thank uh, the Davidson community for this amazing day that I've had. I've had such a great time visiting with your students, with your faculty, with your neighbors. Uh, Bill Crystal, somebody who I've admired for so long. It was fun to be able to duet uh, with you today. Uh, President Quillen, thank you for your hospitality. Uh, people here say they call her Carol. Back in D.C., the two words they've been waiting to say, Madam President. <laughs> uh, my lifelong friend, Mark Johnson, uh, got me here, and we've had so many good times going back to the Richmond Times-Dispatch. I admire him, his family, his work uh, so much. And Katie, you did such a great job. Thank you. And I've had a great time talking to uh, Katie and her partner in crime, Ethan, about the great work that they're doing at the Davidsonian, which really reflects a lot of what I've been hearing here at Davidson. They've been very intentional about connecting with the community, connecting with the state. Uh, believe it or not, Katie, the uh, co-editor, actually he physically delivers the paper to the uh, uh, coffee shops uh, on Main Street. And uh, I heard so much about that. I heard a lot about the uh, innovation in the curriculum that your faculty is, is doing to connect uh, with the community. So it's been fun to learn the story, uh, one of the great uh, journalists of our time, Michael Cruz, a former colleague. I'm honored that he's here, so uh, we'll have a fun uh, night. To pl plunge into uh, Bill's question about how media is changing. And there's just two words that have always guided what I and my partners in crime have done. So back in 2006, uh, two buddies of mine, John Harris, who's the, um, uh, who's, uh, the top uh, person uh, at Politico, uh, Jim Vandehei and I um, were talking about how there were all these great digital tools available for media. You could post anything anywhere and it could be read anywhere forever. And yet, 
Back in 2006, some of you will remember, we didn't really use those tools. We kind of wrote the paper as if it were gonna just be in the driveway. And we wrote one story and we finished around 6.30, for me, probably seven. Uh, the news, the network newscasts were the same. Once in a while, they'd put an update online, but it was really just what we used to call shovelware. You take the paper and you put it online. And so the insight that John Harris and Jim Benahai had was, what if we took those digital tools and really to put them to work for our audience? And how could we serve the people who really care about politics better? So Politico, launched in January 07, the very month that the Hillary Obama uh, race was uh, just starting. So it was a good time for a political website. And we said people want more speed, they want more expertise and authority, and they want more voice. One of John's brilliant insights was that reporters are always more interesting in a bar than they are in the paper. And- um, It's true uh, of people in general. But yes, yeah. <laughs> touche. Um, unfortunately, that's still true, but we've tried to close the gap. And that was the idea behind uh, Portico. And we took uh, three of us with the support of Robert Alberton. Uh, three of us uh, built it to 500 people around the world. And then in January 2017, 10 years to the day later, Jim and I and another partner in crime from uh, Portico, Roy Schwartz, launched Axios. And we put a manifesto on the web, uh, and uh, people who've seen him on TV will know it's a very Jim Van High word. The manifesto is definitely Jim. And the first two words of it, which is how we make every decision. My colleagues will tell you whatever they ask me about tech, about money, about ads, about anything. I always, give, I always think about it through the same prism. And that is the two words are audience first. Like what if you invented a news organization, a website, a newsletter for the audience instead of for the journalist. And so Axios is built around what we call smart brevity. So you hop onto axios.com, every story starts as roughly one iPhone screen, uh, my newsletter, Axios AM, Mike's top 10, just 10 items, always around a five, six minute read. And the reason is audience first. I think about the person who's in bed, the person who's at coffee, and I want them to talk to their kid or listen to a podcast or tape a podcast or take a walk or whatever. They don't need to be with my newsletter all morning. So uh, we boil it down and in smart brevity give you, gives you what matters. And uh, to answer your question, like that audience first mentality, we need to always be thinking about how it is that the people in this room, the smart, curious, news consumers in this room want news. And sometimes you're gonna want a video, sometimes you're gonna want a podcast, and we're gonna make sure we get you that. And I think if you read, read, read Politico, or read Politico, still read Politico, and Axios, you'll get good news and, and intelligently presented. Um, so I guess the obvious question though is how much is this, it's a happy story if, for Politico and Axios, is it a happy story overall for the media? I mean, are people getting more and better news than they used to? Is it, are they getting, are they, you know, a few, 100,000 are getting good information from you, but millions are getting bad information elsewhere online. How worried are you about a lot of the criticisms, not criticisms, just worries about where we're going as a society in terms of our ability to communicate? Profoundly, and uh, we can unpack it into a couple of uh, uh, buckets. Like one is, like I mentioned, I came up literally in local news. I worked for the Fredericksburg Freelance Star in Virginia, Mark Johnson and I worked at the Richmond Times Dispatch, when there was a, a competing paper, we both worked night police uh, going into uh, neighborhoods. I, uh, definitely a rookie move. So we had these uh, the Chevrolet, the white unmarked Chevrolet Cavalier. We called them the Cadavalier. And they, the, this was the old days where you had like radio scanners. And every time they would upgrade the radio or it got stolen, they would put a new antenna on the back so it's a white unmarked cadaverier with like eight antennas on the back. <laughs> and if you wanna know the rookie from Washington and Lee, I thought that would keep me safer. Turns out like that's not uh, the look that you want uh, when you're cruising around uh, Richmond. Um, but I came out of local news and I, I covered, uh, when I was at the Freelance Star, I covered two rural 
counties and one day Susan Tremblay was on vacation and I got to cover the Stafford planners and I was very excited about that. I put on a tie. And so I, I, I came up that way. That's my sensibility. The, th there's two massive problems in media. One of them is local news, that it's so much harder for local news outlets of all sorts to do the great coverage that they have um, all the time that we've been alive by people who care so much. As you know, local news people, they just care so much, whether it's taking the picture of every person who comes in or, or, uh, or whatever it is. And now that's really hard. And so A, you're not getting the information uh, that you uh, need and should have from uh, something as simple as local uh, city council meetings and school board meetings. But also, no one's watching the people who are spending our money. And I talk to people in government, and they will tell you, they decide things differently when people aren't watching. And now in most of America, people are not watching. When Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor of California, 30 people covered him every day. Now there are maybe seven at most news organizations that cover the California governor, the eighth biggest uh, economy in the world. So that's one problem. There's not, we claim to have a lot of answers, as you'll quickly see, but uh, we have no answer to the local what news if, yeah, I mean, problem. If, People have tried the NPR model. Like the only model that's worked is having a rich person buy you. That worked for the Washington Post, it worked for Time Magazine, it worked for the LA Times, but that is not, as they say, scalable. I guess it could be. I mean, there are a lot of rich people, and maybe, no, seriously, maybe news entities will end up more like colleges and universities, which is they'll be, they will not actually, they will require a subsidy, but they'll be five, you know, they'll be charitable uh, organizations that re receive gifts from, from wealthy people and from foundations that supplements the, in the case of news organizations, subscriptions, in the case of universities, tuition. I mean, it wouldn't be, we, we are used to a model where they're profitable enterprises, but I suppose you wouldn't have to have that, right? It's interesting. And something I thought of uh, just now that uh, uh, stuck in my mind after talking with Katie and Ethan about what they're up to at the Davidsonian, like it's an opportunity for the great university and college papers like they used to compete with or just ignore the local papers now you have more resources but why uh, is maybe more reach why is the online i mean this is not a question I, I i i'm very aware i mean i think it's a real problem our friend jim warren who's a friend of yours a friend of mine longtime journalist in the in chicago mostly uh, says springfield illinois the capital of illinois this illinois state legislature has three correspondent three newspapers can afford now to send people to cover the Illinois legislature, the Chicago Tribune, maybe the Chicago Sun-Times, maybe the Springfield paper itself, that's it. And you know, the Illinois legislature, it's not, it is not a group of politicians you want to leave unsupervised. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was like half of the recent Illinois governors are in jail or something like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a genuine problem, I think, of governance and accountability. I guess one question though is, well, okay, why everyone knows print papers have become mostly become uneconomic. Why can't you have websites? Why does the Axios or political model not work for North Carolina or Illinois? I, uh, I can uh, say it in uh, three notes. Um, for every dollar that the Charlotte Observer got for a print ad, they get 10 cents for a website and a penny for your phone. So the, so the, the, yeah, so the digital advertising just never will come within a country mile of making up for the print advertising. And a couple of our great news organizations, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Financial Times, have been able to uh, get a much healthier uh, uh, balance where uh, half or more of their revenue comes from their readers because traditionally what you paid for the paper um, uh, when we were growing up 50 cents or whatever what you paid for the newspaper all the time that we were growing up that covered literally the ink and the paper like everything else all the reporters all that came from advertisers and um, that that balance remains for our countries around the pa papers around the country. And so that's why this math problem will never work. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when I first came to Washington, I once had this conversation with the owner of the Post. I mean, he said, because before actually Google really destroyed everyone with, you know, the ability for people to purchase Google, you know, search ads as opposed to buying ads in newspapers or either online or in print. But Craigslist actually began to do them in because classified ads were the single greatest revenue, the greatest revenue source for a newspaper was having a whole page in which a lot of people paid 
fair amount of money. A page, to, it was one, a section. Right, for 164th of that page, and the entire labor of the Washington Post was, you know, making sure the thing was laid out correctly in little boxes, right? And they got, I mean, that was an unbelievable revenue source. That collapsed, obviously, with the internet, and I think that's the same has happened, of course, with car, autos, you know, one remembers how theater much. Theater listings? Yeah, yeah, theater listings, autos. So, so that's depressing. If we're not going to have local news, that's kind of a problem for the society. Yeah, but, but wait, I'm going to make you even more depressed. Um, <laughs> uh, but first, just a caveat, a reason you should never listen to me. So when newspapers used to, were first getting their economic problems, I used to say to people, um, there will always be newspapers because people will always want TV listings. And like people, <laughs> people would laugh, now they laugh for the wrong reason, but yeah, at the time, that was a, like a chuckle. It's like, it's like, and then I said, there will always be a, I said, the last two things that are printed on paper will be the Bible and the Sunday Times because people want the weddings. But now, like, people don't even really want the weddings. <laughs> They read them online, I guess, oh, yeah. Oh, wait, so the, so the other massive problem with, with journalism is the Fox effect, the MSNBC effect. The fact that we're all just, we're going to our corners. The social platforms are feeding us more of what we want rather than uh, a more balanced diet that we used to. So we used to have a pretty good news diet of like people in this room, like we'd, we'd get some world coverage and some politics and some sports and maybe a Hollywood story. And now so many people in America, like their news diet is Trump, 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 especially if you're online, especially if you're on cable. And there are economic reasons for that too. So, so we're rewiring our brains to want too much politics, devote more of our brains to politics than we should. And here are the economics of that, that if you're a morning or evening cable TV program, the audience punishes you if you put on a story about Broadway or put on an author. Like the auth the audiences want Trump. And online, a lot of that audience rewards Trump coverage. And Axios has taken a different approach. We have great White House coverage, but we also cover media and tech and space and 5G. And uh, and make other coverage available. So there's more great coverage available to everyone everywhere than in the history of humanity, but it's also like being drowned out uh, by a lot of crap. I mean, the degree to it, I guess I, this was brought home to me uh, in the Weekly Standard while, while it still existed. We, had, we used to have cruises every year, which our subscribers, with some of them, would come on and pay for and pay extra to have panels with us and, and Fred Barnes and Steve Hayes and me and others. What about and the cruise? And the, the cruises? Yeah, I was saying, they, we yeah. did these cruises. And what's, this was like in 2017, so we were kind of, Steve Hayes and I were fairly anti-Trump and other people were more mixed, but a lot of our cruisers had voted for Trump and were pro-Trump. They were you know, conservatives, Republicans, and so forth. And we had dinner, it was, it was fine, but everyone was polite, of course, and we liked each other. But I remember at one point at dinner having an argument about something, this is about how many, some of the cruisers said the election, I said, you look, you, Trump's gotta be careful, he should expand his base, he lost by two and a half million votes or so in the popular vote, he can't just assume, you know, he really, if, if I were he, he should be reaching out to new voters, not just doubling down on his base. That's the point actually Mike made in, in, in class today. Uh, and uh, one of the people said, no, no, but that's just, f that's just fake. I mean, there were three million votes that were stolen, uh, three million illegal votes in California or something like that. And I said, that's really not, they've looked into this pretty carefully and I can explain even where this misunderstanding comes from, but it's not actually true. And the cruisers, and there were several of them from one city, you know, the friends who'd come, intelligent people, well-educated, successful, uh, nice people, weekly standard readers, so what could be better, you know? Um, <laughs> just insisted it was true. And it was, they had seen it online, they had seen it on a Facebook post, it had been circulated on an email, they'd seen it many times on sort of quote news sites. And at some point you do worry that, I mean, and that's not, there are a million cases of this on right, left, center, uh, but you worry that at what point, you know, how do you ever correct something like that and how much are we going down a path where there's no authoritative, or not authoritative is not even the right word, but no common source of news or facts or truth. How much do you worry about that? I mean. Ah, it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, but I will say the media is complicit in this. So the media has done plenty to undermine your trust in us. So if you look at how we covered 2016, we had one job. And our job was to understand America and explain it to you. And 
the results of that election made it clear that like there was a big hole in our approach and like uh, something I, I talked to your students about today was that like the reason that it's such a treat for me to to uh, come and visit is that it's so important for us to talk to people who live in all parts of America. In 2016, our biggest mistake was we didn't listen. There were very obviously consequential conversations going on in America, including in my family, that were in our blind spot and we missed them. And we're not doing that much better this time around. And so like that trust was undermined and the more that reporters from organizations that we grew up trusting, the more that they sort of get sloppy and go on the Twitters and like give their opinion, like it makes people less likely to trust us. Let's move from this cheerful discussion of the media to, uh, but, and <laughs> to, I, to and politics. I am usually the, the so uh, Jim Vandehei, um, uh, the CEO of Axios, uh, I w I'm an optimist. I would call him a pessimist. He would call himself a realist. And uh, we were saying, we, we used to have a TV show. You throw out a situation, and uh, I would say why it rocks, and he says why it sucks. So usually I am the sunny guy, but these are not sunny times. Yeah, no, I, I, what about, and what about the interaction of that then with uh, politics, which doesn't seem to penalize uh, demagoguery or promises? I mean, if you want to, on both sides, I would say, or promises that don't come through, or there seems to be much, maybe there never was, we've always had demagogues, we've always had pie in the sky promises, maybe things haven't changed that much. What's your sense, you've been in Washington for how long? I mean, you've been covering politics for? Uh, I came in 99 to, co to cover the um, long-lived Bill Bradley campaign. Yeah, that's good. Sure something. <laughs> Did you have, uh, I watched Bill Bradley as a kid in New York, so Madison Square Garden, so I'm still very fond of him. Um, and he was a good senator, actually. What, I mean, how much, do you think the quality of our public discourse, is this just older people like me thinking, oh, it's declined, it was great in the good old days, or has there been a real decline, do you think? I mean. There's plenty of great discourse in America. We've had it here. Like I had a fascinating time around a table with your students. We had a great, uh, uh, President Quillen was kind of so, to have us over for like a great dinner, and we like had a great conversation about America and, and society. Like the, the question is, like, can you modulate, tune your life, your input, so that you're having those conversations and it's not drowned out by everything goes to 11. I had a friend who worked for a news organization heading into uh, the 2016 election. And uh, he was very attuned to, he was trying to ga game, the, um, game the robots to like get traffic for his website. And he said, if you, he called it having your head in the Facebook machine. And he said, if you had your head in your Facebook machine, like very attuned to what was moving, he said, you saw Trump coming much more clearly. And because you could see what people were reading, like some of it, like the material, uh, a different way to say it, a um, TV producer said to me, he said, uh, he said, the funny thing about the Trump victory, he said, the ratings turned out to be more accurate than the polls. Yeah. People just wanted to see the Trump show. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's always been, politics has always been about entertainment. The Greeks discussed this, the Romans, but Elizabethan England, I mean, it's famous, but it does seem, seems like in the last 20, 30, 40 years, that distinction has been elided. We're reading in our class later this term, that book by Neil Post, Postman, uh, it was called Amusing Ourselves to Death which I think was published in 85, which was very early actually, where he worries about the collapse of any sort of sense that, well, news is different from entertainment and truth is different from opinion. And I do feel like we've moved pretty far down that road over the last two decades. I will throw it. Almost everyone in this room knows more about uh, history than I do. But I read something fascinating that made me question the idea, oh, we've never seen anything like this. Right. So uh, the New York Times has done two they've probably done lots, but the, they do this series, this very ambitious biographical series about the candidates, the long run. It's a very elegant name, uh, amazing journalism. There's two in particular that stuck in my mind. They were both about Biden. One, on, I think it was this Sunday uh, that they did something about Biden and the Bork vote, and that's very worthy of your time, very worth reading. I'll, 
Alex Burns wrote it, and it's really good. But the one that stuck in my mind, uh, they did one uh, shortly after uh, the MSNBC debate, and they looked at Biden and Bussin. And in 1971, so I was alive, in 1971, people were shooting at buses in Boston. Astonishing. And so we can get overly rosy as we think back. Yeah, I was on a panel with Bill Galston, who was in the Clinton White House, you know, and very serious, thoughtful guy, professor of political philosophy and political science. And we were just having this kind of similar discussion of things, were things better once? And, the, and this was on the fifth, by pure chance, this was out of Berkeley, actually. It was the 50th, it was last year, the 50th anniversary of Bobby Kennedy's assassination. So someone said something appropriate about that. It was kind of on our minds. And I said, made your point, I mean, which I think is true to a large degree. We can get awfully pessimistic about today, but compared to, I mean, people who were, I was a kid then, you know, high school, but I mean, if you want real social crisis, real, you know, division, real, the society's coming apart at the seams, and we're fighting a war that we're going to end up not winning and lose 55,000 uh, people and so forth. You know, let's look back at the late 60s and early 70s. And Bill's formulation was the society was in more trouble then, but our politics are in more trouble now. I wonder if you agree with that, that I mean, that the political system seems more dysfunctional now than it did then, even though in some ways we're wealthier and we're not having the Civil War and we're not having riots much and we're not fighting a war like Vietnam. No, it's a great question of our time. To what degree are the institutions up to the moment and in, to what degree are our great institutions adapting to the moment? Let's, um, let's take questions in about 15 minutes. So I think we're both very curious to know what's on your minds, but I, wanna, I haven't warned Mike to do this, but I wanna ask you just, you've been there in Washington, you've been in so many, you've covered campaigns, as you said, White Houses, senators, uh, members of Congress, you've, uh, You've been in so many dramatic moments. I'm just going to ask for some, like, reminiscence. Some most, uh, I don't know, favorite politician you covered? So one thing that uh, I learned uh, covering the my first campaign, your first campaign is always going to be your most um, uh, memorable. When I was in uh, Virginia, um, I, you may remember this. Um, some of you will remember when Oliver North, the um, uh, Iran-Contra figure, ran for Senate. And it was one of the great political races of our time because he was running against Chuck Robb. Some of you will remember a Marine, Linda, uh, is LBJ's son-in-law. He was married in the White House, a literal East Room wedding. And uh, he was a Marine, uh, had been governor of Virginia, now he was senator from Virginia, and he'd had an affair. And uh, everybody said that... Uh, uh, that uh, Linda Robb had married the wrong Marine. Um, but so you had uh, Oliver North, who was famous around the world for his shenanigans. You had uh, Chuck Robb, who was one of the most famous uh, politicians in America. And then uh, you had Doug Wilder, the first elected uh, black governor in America, who was running against them as an independent, as a spoiler. As an astonishing race. But there's a... Um, Audience first, there's something in this for you. Uh, there's an awesome documentary about this race, and it's called A Perfect Candidate. And the reason it's called A Perfect Candidate was that uh, I was in an African-American church in downtown Richmond with Chuck Robb. And some of you who have, a lot of you have worked in politics, you know that when politicians go to worship uh, with someone, like there's a like very specific ritual. You have to have the right people take you around. Like you sit down front. It's very awkward. Uh, you have to stay the whole time. And <laughs> there can be two, three offerings. Um, uh, but you stay. And th this amazing side, I was sitting in the, um, in the, the, the choir loft. Um, this African-American minister trying to explain to his congregation, why it was important that they vote for Chuck Robb instead of Oliver North, with all of them knowing what Chuck Robb had done. And there was a moment when the minister said, there is no perfect candidate. And that became the name of the film. Uh, since this is the week of 9-11, uh, 
You, where, where were you then? Were you covering the White House at that point? Or? Yeah, so I was uh, with President Bush in Florida. Oh, I didn't realize and that. Was, okay, well, tell us what that was like. Yeah, so in, um, uh, when uh, the president travels, um, 13 journalists travel on Air Force One with him. So a camera from AP, AFP and Reuters, uh, a couple of newspaper reporters, a rotating producer and camera crew. So if it's ABC, it goes in alphabetical order. So if it's ABC today, it'll be CBS tomorrow, NBC the next day. And so 13 journalists were with the president on Air Force One. And then in those days, very little of this travel is done now, but in those days, a second plane of other reporters, the reporters who weren't in that rotation, would go with him. So I was would go uh, separately. So there's maybe 50 reporters. So we were at an elementary school in Florida. You had been on Air Force One or you had been on the charter? Post- I'd been on the charter. On the press yeah, plane. Yeah, yeah. You landed. You, were, you yeah. were there already. Yeah. Right. And the technology behind this part hasn't changed. That wherever the president goes, the networks set up a, a joint operation so that they can send live video anywhere in the world, anytime. And they call it the transmission pool. And they also rotate that. And while uh, President uh, Bush, behind closed doors, was reading My Pet Goat to uh, other students uh, there, we were just waiting for him to come out. So we were in a room exactly, exactly like this. And um, still had pagers in those days. And Scott McClellan, who then was uh, the deputy uh, press secretary, he got a text or a page that something was going on. And so we went out into the uh, transmission pool and to watch. And we watched uh, the second plane go into the building. And David Sanger from the New York Times was standing there and he said, like, we're going to be covering this uh, the rest of our life. And it turned out to be true. And then you, what they let you, so when the president's, when Andy Card famously, the chief of staff, leans over President Bush's shoulder and whispers to him, we were, you yeah. were watching that? Yeah, so, so you all have seen this video, and I'm with Bush on this one. So people will criticize him for not flipping out. Um, but, if, but if you think about these events and think about the ecosystem around the, the president, think about the teachers who are there, who, are, who the kids were there. Anyway, it probably, it probably took a little while to sink in. And there's a book out tomorrow by Garrett Graff, an oral history of 9-11, it's very, very worth reading, whether you get it on paper, as Katie still gets her books, or whether you get it as, as an ebook. But uh, Garrett, this, this article started as an article for Washingtonian, where he got the recollection of, of Andy Card and others. And now it's a book, and it's brand new tomorrow, Garrett Graff, and for sure is worth getting. But, but uh, it did take a while for, for to soak in for the president. And uh, Air Force One took off, and you'll remember went to uh, office off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, which turns out was the doomsday location for the president. It was very spooky. There was a there was like a podium and a flag and it was it was set up and, for and the press charter followed Air Force One there? No, so this is the this is the good part. You'll see uh, how uh, what a uh, intrepid reporter I am. So the pre- Air Force One went Mike, on to Mike paid me to set this went all up on for to him, yeah. uh, off at Nebraska, and uh, so we were just stuck. We were literally stuck in um, in Florida, and like as you know, the the airspace was empty, and so they decided. And like a lot of you were around then, like we didn't really know what was happening, and so they arranged a plane for us to go back. And I started to think, is it really a good idea to be the only plane in the air? in like all of America. And uh, my colleagues were like, of course it is. And uh, it had a, uh, uh, the plane did fine. But it's, it's, it's impossible to convey to uh, people who've come along behind like how much uncertainty there was that day. When you heard the pen, you heard there was a fire on the mall, the Pentagon was on fire. Like, like you believed it all, you just didn't know. Yeah, I guess this this year will be the first year that freshman uh, students might not have been born right on on 9/11. I think so. Uh, exactly so. And a different way to say that is young women and men 
will enlist in the army this year who will go to fight for our freedom who weren't born then. And I don't, yeah. um, so you covered Bush, Obama, and Trump. So you saw them on many off the record settings, I'm sure, and background settings. Give us some sense, a little flavor story or something sure. that they're like, how different they are, you know, as yeah. opposed to when the rest of us see them. Okay, so on the 2000 campaign, uh, I covered it in a very interesting way that no news organization does this. I don't know why we should do this, but I covered Gore for two weeks, Bush for two weeks. Gore for two weeks, Bush for two weeks. Who are you with at this point? Um, the Washington Post. He can barely remember he's been for so many, you know. <laughs> no, it was, it was for the Post, and it was, a, it was a great honor to cover this campaign for the Post. And the reason I did it that way is they had main reporters. Uh, C.C. Connolly was the Gore reporter. Uh, Terry Neal was the uh, George W. Bush reporter. And I was the new guy, and so I would just rotate in. But it was a great way to see it, because you saw it with fresh eyes. And it's one of the greatest gifts that you can have as a reporter, because... If you have a picture on your wall, even if you have a Picasso in your bathroom, like if you look at it every day, like pretty soon you don't see it. And that happens to reporters who cover, I think. So uh, I did Bush two weeks, Gore two weeks. And Gore was the most dysfunctional, toxic press ecosystem I've ever been in. <laughs> so in the, in the Gore, the staff, was always mad at the reporters. The reporters, the staff didn't really like the candidate. The candidate didn't like the press. Something I've never experienced another time in however many years I've been doing this, the reporters didn't like each other. Like that is a first because we always bond against uh, the tyrants that uh, we're covering. Um, and the reporters had disliked Gore so much that usually you're so excited when your candidate like comes back on the plane to talk to you. Um, when Gore would come back on Air Force Two, the reporters would put on their headphones because they just <laughs> didn't want to talk to him. And then you went to the George W. Bush campaign and it was like the lights came on and the music came up and, the, and it's, it's politics is so personal. There can't be a reporter on that plane who agreed with George W. Bush ideologically, but they loved him because he worked them and he would come back off the record, he'd have his USA Today and he'd have the, the score, the box scores, he'd, he'd make fun of like where the reporters went to school, like talking about their fancy educations even though he went to Yale. Um, <laughs> and uh, Ann Kornblut, who later worked at the New York Times, now at Facebook, she worked at the Boston Globe. Because she worked at the Boston Globe, he, assumed she had to, she kept thinking she went to Vassar. Like she went to like, t she went to school in Texas. But just in his mind, somebody went to work for the Boston Globe, but, but he came back and he worked it. And then he loved the um, cameraman. He's the, the cameraman, uh, some of the uh, photographers were more conservative and Bush would always go back and he'd be like, these are my people. But they really made a difference in the coverage. Like the coverage of those people was very different and it was not ideological. It was personal. Like people saw a personal side of Bush, saw part of me either, either trying to connect or uh, connecting or however you want to say it, and it made a difference in the coverage. Now one thing about George W. Bush, he was a morning person. And remember the Bushisms, the George W. Bush, um, so one of my favorites was uh, he said, um, I know how hard it is to put food on your family. And, <laughs> and uh, another, another good one, a, a Freudian Bushism was, he said, I'm here to break the cufflinks of taxation. <laughs> uh, but he always said those at night. Like it was always at night. And what's funny is, like we would get all excited and write about the dumb things George W. Bush said. His political guy, Carl Rove, thought it was great because he knew that in a lot of America, people thought we were making fun of them. So two other politicians, you can give a quick uh, President Obama and John McCain, two pretty extraordinary political figures whom you had the, I think, privilege of spending a fair amount of time with. Yeah, so John McCain, you uh, spent time on the Straight Talk Express. Yeah. Just, you tell them Straight Talk Express real quick and I'll jump, chat in. 
I mean, John McCain was, un, you know, he was a really an outside shot when he began the race in 99 against George W. Bush. Other people were in the race who were supposed to do much better, uh, Mrs. Dole and John Kasich and my old boss, Dan Quayle. And McCain was this, you know, but he took a shot and, uh, and then they decided, he and his top campaign guy, Mike Murphy, a very witty and intelligent political operative, decided we're just going to ride around on this bus in New Hampshire, to do endless town halls, tell the truth, and above all, just be totally accessible all the time. And McCain would sit there on the back of the bus, which was set up with sort of a table so you could, you know, eight, six or eight people kind of could get around it, right? And they would just talk for hours. And people would say, let's go off the record here, Senator. And, no, no, it's okay. And he said things, some of which got him in a little trouble, but talking about, I think, wooing the press in a pretty clever, contrarian way, because normally, you know, the way you woo the press is, well, let's have an off-the-record dinner where I can be candid. McCain was sort of flipped that on its head, right? It was, I'm going to be totally on the record all the time, and I'm going to be candid. And he almost pulled it off, right? And uh, it was hours and hours and hours on the record. There were seven spots, and there's a reporter then with the uh, LA Times, T. Christian Miller, T. Miller. He was able to fold himself up into the speaker shelf up there and so he was the he was always on like he was the eighth spot because like i'm not getting in the speaker shelf um and the, and this is such a sign of how the times have changed the so he he's just talking and it's all on the record the new york times and the washington post had a deal that they made with the campaign that they they would either both be on or both be off like it was just like it was such uh, another time when they just believed that if they weren't there, it didn't happen, and they didn't care. Um, but, but this is the thing about the picture on the wall. The reporters, I w as, once again, I was the new guy, and so I flipped it, sw slipped in. And the reporters were just so used to saying it. And uh, one day, McCain, on, we're rolling through Iowa or wherever we were, and McCain said he could recognize a gay person by looking at them. <laughs> and... It was a different era. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't know better. Like, I'm young reporter of the Washington Post. What do I do? I did a story about John McCain's super gaydar, right? <laughs> and, and this is the amazing thing. And nobody else wrote it. There were, there were eight, eight other reporters there. But it, just, like, imagine all the other stuff that we missed. And I wrote the story, and Todd Harris, who was his press guy, he said, he said, ah, it's our fault. We didn't make any news today. It's funny that you mentioned the Times and the Post feeling like they were, you know, special. They were just, they, re they really did, the Times especially. There's a famous story about a New York Post reporter, a young New York Post reporter, who begins at the New York Post. There's a con press conference with the mayor or the city council president or something, the chief, police chief. There's a crime in New York. And the Post reporter dutifully gets there at 10 o'clock. The Times reporter gets strolls in at 10.15, and the press conference begins at 10.16. And it's the Post reporter spent about three months thinking, how does the Times reporter always know when the press conference is really going to begin? <laughs> <laughs> like not realizing that the press conference begins when the Times reporter shows up, you know? <laughs> it, 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 it's more egalitarian now, I would say, you know, in that respect, maybe. Uh, uh, related story, uh, when Rupert Murdoch was going to Macy's, uh, trying to get uh, more uh, fancy ads, and uh, the person at Macy said, Rupert, your readers are our shoplifters. <laughs> okay, one last, President Obama. You, I mean, you, had, you already were at Politico at that point, but you, yeah. you, you met him many times, yes. right? President Ob Obama, and uh, we talked about this in class today. Something that was unique about President Obama was that he started as the real deal underdog. And it's hard to remember or realize this now. But in January 07, when Politico started, if you wanted a future in politics, you were with the Clinton campaign. And so there was an incredibly tight bond among those people who started with him in Chicago because they cared about him or they couldn't get a job on the Hillary campaign or whatever. But for whatever reason, like they had a really, a, a, a real bond that lasted. And similarly with the uh, McKinneyacks, uh, for sure, were a unique group, Romney up in Boston, George W. Bush down in Austin, but there were very few, quote, Trump people. And we're seeing the effect of, the, of this today. Like, he did not have the Trump people to staff an administration with 
uh, that an Obama, for instance, uh, did. Now, some uh, a lot of cliches and a lot of uh, images about politicians are true, like like the whole thing about Obama and how cool he was it was totally true. Uh, one of the photographers was telling me that uh, the, the the holy grail for f a news magazine photographer in the days when Time and Newsweek were big were to get behind the scenes with a candidate. And so this reporter uh, had haggled, 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 used all his chips with the campaign to get behind the scenes with Obama. And he said, you get behind the scenes with Obama? He doesn't do anything. He like takes a sip of water. <laughs> and, uh, but he did it very artfully and it was on the cover of Time Magazine. Questions uh, about media, government, politics, other topics? Mike knows a lot about technology, et cetera. Let's, we'll give preference to students, maybe. Can we do that? Uh, uh, for sure. And please say who you are. Yeah. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Alex Eggerman. I'm a senior political science major. And I mean, well, I'd like to, my question is really like a serious topic. Now, I know that you talked about like the growing division with like the Fox effect and the MSNBC effect. And uh, I really, I'm really, I'm really concerned about your opinion on like alternative like media sources, like, or maybe like, I don't want to say fake news, but there can be literal fake news sources like Infors out there. I'm just curious what your opinion on and like what maybe, what strategy, you, strategies maybe we could use to like combat like the polarization and misinformation that fake news can create. Uh, I'll start and Mike can th think of something wittier and more profound to say. Um, Look, I mean, I think it's a huge question, and I'd say I've talked just randomly, not randomly, but I got I was interested in this topic, and I, in the last month or two, I've talked to a fair number of people who have looked into this, including people from the intelligence community, you're more interested in the national security side, as well as media professionals and stuff. And they're based, they are worried. I um, had a dinner just last, this week, with someone at one of the big tech companies, the Google, Facebook type companies, who's very high up and spends all of his time and has 20, you know, 2,000 people working from spending all their time worrying about what, how to combat this. And it is very hard. We have the First Amendment. We don't want in private companies probably sort of making arbitrary decisions here. These people are out and these people are in. Some things are obviously pure disinformation. Even there, it can take a while to track them down. And I said, is it going to get better or worse? Have we seen the worst of it? And, he, and he, his view was it, it could really get bad. I mean, the technology has progressed so much. We now have deep fakes where by 2020, it could be the case, three days before the election, Elizabeth Warren, let's just say, is running as the Democratic nominee, and something shows up on 1,000 or 100,000 uh, Facebook pages and Twitter and, and everywhere else uh, with Elizabeth Warren seeming to say something about how she's going to, I don't know, take, confiscate everyone's bank accounts or whatever. And it will be very, very difficult to distinguish it. It'll be a deep fake. It'll be a, something that's been done by you know, AI and, and, and so forth. And it'll take, now they'll see it right away if it's that, and they'll still be get, you know, correct it right away. But even so, I mean, will some percentage of the population believe it? Will it swing half a percent of the vote? Could that make a difference? And, and once we went to talk through that scenario, he said that's actually not the most worrisome, though, because that would be so obvious, presumably, that it would right away get corrected. There'd be a huge news stories about the correction, and people would kind of you know, understand that that was a fake, an attempt by the Russians, let's say, or someone else, the Chinese, or, or people here to swing the election. But what about more subtle ways of doing this? And what if it's not done in such an overt way? What if it's done beneath the radar? And could you move voters in ways that really are purposeful but uh, based on lies uh, in 2020, let alone even after that. And are we ready to really deal with that? And is the technology outs, you know, outsailed our ability to deal with it? And he was pretty, he was really worried about this. And uh, related and perhaps uh, even tougher to detect our deep fake audio. And Axios has had great coverage of this. We have a, a tech team including um, Kave Waddell who covers emerging tech uh, in Menlo Park is his job. And uh, it's a massive problem because, and from the campaign's point of view, like some of these things will be hard to disprove. So do you have to start like filming your candidate all the time to try to prove a negative? Uh, it's something that for sure we haven't grappled with, either on the media side or on the campaign side. There was a historian at this dinner and he, uh, she actually made a good point, which is that um, this was a huge problem 
centuries ago with money, right? Counterfeit money. I mean, this is a huge issue in history. They were always minting, you know, fake coin. Kings are running out of money and minting, you know, bad coins, bad coin, bad coins drive out good. There's a huge literature on all this. And we ended up with banknotes and we ended up with, uh, you know, watermarks basically, or ways to really make it very difficult. It's kind of amazing when you think about it that we have, you know, zill trillions of dollars floating around in the U.S. and a very small percentage of it actually are, is uh, forgeries, even though you'd think it wouldn't be that hard to do. But the way this historian put it, and she asked the person from the tech company, do you have anything like that? And he said, yeah, we could, we could, but we don't right now, or we don't, certainly don't require it, right? The Axios doesn't have to get a stamp on an article before it goes up. And what if someone goes up with, you know, it's not so hard to mimic the Axios look, right? I'm sure you guys have thought about this a lot. You could have a piece by Mike Allen of Axios, breaking news, Saturday before the election. And it, how long would it take before it's obvious that it's not really a piece by Mike Allen of Axios, even though it looks exactly like a Mike Allen Axios piece? I mean, I think that is really a worrisome prospect. So, any other cheerful? Yes, next year. Students, any, I think we were trying to give preference to students. Students should speak up here or? If not, we'll move to non-students. I can't see too well, so you. Okay, student in the back. Okay, well. <laughs> Take advantage of being thought to be a student, you know. For, former student of Dr. Roberts. Uh, so I, I'm glad you brought up history. Um, <clears throat> I've been thinking about the history of media a little bit over the last you know, year or so. And isn't it, isn't it possible that the era that we're living in now is maybe maybe more historically appropriate than the last 20, 50 years. I mean, I th I'm thinking about like yellow journalism, right? Like the, the Hearsts of the world that maybe started the Spanish-American War or certainly influenced US government policy based off just ideas they had or guesses. I'm thinking about like the papers that, you know, the bankers ran, like JP Morgan, people like that. They had, they had media arms that would do their work for them in, in papers. And so I think about the garbage that we see today. I mean, isn't it possible that the last, again, the last 50 years was really maybe a historical blip and we're moving back into this decentralized model where everyone has a voice and it's, it's on the consumer to weed out the bad from the good rather than just trusting the institution? I mean, I would say, so I think it's a very interesting point and there is some truth to that, I think, that there's probably a, a the sort of relative confidence in mainstream journalism, if you want to call it that, of the, you know, post-World War II period up to whatever, maybe the end of the century, is probably a little unusual. The, the consolidation, it had its downsides too, incidentally. You know, I mean, if you read an account of Vietnam, which I mentioned earlier, a lot of the blame is put on, you know, the fact that there are only really, what, two or three major national newspapers, three TV networks, no one else had access to anything, really. And so if you could shape the narrative of those very few institutions, you could get us into a war that was probably very foolish to get into and we didn't get out of and so forth. And maybe in some ways the decentralization is, is, has its own virtues and, and merits. The one thing I would say, though, is in a funny way, if you go back to the Jeffersonian, Hamiltonian period where there's, they're making up scurrilous rumors about each other, they were known to be party newspapers. There was no tradition against, I mean, now you could argue you get the worst of both worlds, which is you get a certain deference to some of the media because people are still sort of used to the notion that the network news is gonna be at least somewhat based on reality and the major papers are gonna check things and they can't just make up stuff. If people sort of believe that and then people start making up stuff, that's more dangerous. In the old days, one has the impression they all just thought everything was just scurrilous and made up, and they kind of could ignore it pretty quickly. Uh, so maybe, maybe it is a, just going back to the older days, but maybe it's actually even a little more dangerous. And the technology. I mean, I think there you have an ability to deceive that is different from, you know, some pamphlet that gets circulated. That's one thing. You know, that's, you have to sit and read it. I mean, it's interesting. I was just reading about this the other day. I mean, every technological breakthrough has had its huge pluses and huge minuses, right? And we're probably at an era, we are at an era of major technological breakthroughs, obviously in terms of computers and information sharing and so forth. And it has its pluses and minuses. Very intelligent people in the 30s looked at the radio, thought this is really dangerous. And now we can't even kind of imagine that. And they thought it because the what country was the one that, whose political leaders most exploited the radio? What country gave free radios? to almost all of its citizens, Nazi Germany. And in fact, many serious scholars have argued that without the radio, Hitler doesn't get the kind of 
almost, you know, I don't know what you call it exactly, uh, a crazy kind of control over the public mind that, you know, it's one thing to distribute newspapers or pamphlets everywhere. It doesn't have the same immediacy, obviously, as the voice on the radio. And then people worried about TV in the 50s and 60s and its effect on politics. Now, these things eventually work themselves out in a way, right? So that's the good news. The bad news is you can go through some pretty rough times until they work themselves out. Yes. Um, I can, yes. Um, my question is about uh, the impact of what the media is choosing to cover, particularly over the last two or three years. And let's use um, Hurricane Dorian and its lack of march through Alabama as a current example. Trump tweets about it multiple times daily and the, re and the media reports about it multiple times daily. So which is the chicken and which is the egg? Now you have a choice, and Axios didn't report Alabama because we didn't think it was worthy of your time. I mean, I would say, so, I, I mean, it's, look, it's, uh, the whole question is, it's very complicated, obviously. I mean, not complicated, it's just it's hard to know, hard to disentangle different things that are going on at the same time. From a more political view, I'll just say this is a conservative and Republican who's unhappy with the sort of Fox News Trump uh, version of conservatism and, and the Republican Party, so just take this as coming from me, it's just my opinion. Uh, I think Trump, it, I, don't think it all, I don't think it gets anywhere near to the scale it's at without the President of the United States doing it. You can have a lot of irresponsible news items, we've had uh, organs, we've had those throughout our history. You can have demagogues on the radio, we've had those throughout our history, even on TV. You can have a whole network maybe that's pushing a certain point of view and even pushing some conspiracy theories. I think a lot of those things, voters, citizens, have a certain discount. Well, it's some news organization saying this, but another news organization saying that, and you know, my neighbor down the street says that's not true. So it's, you know, who knows, maybe there's some truth, but not too much. I do think people kind of assumed until recently that the president of the United States, they might dislike him or her, I guess they were all hims, uh, they might um, you know, distrust him. There were times when their, the government lied to us and uh, obviously Vietnam would be an example where there was probably some real question of whether you know, people were being candid to say the least. Still, at the end of the day, having a president who echoes and fosters a certain uh, theories and certain claims uh, pretty relentlessly, I think, has a big effect. People have a certain, there's only one president. There's Fox News, there's MSNBC, there's CNN, there's this radio, talk radio, there's that talk radio, there's Axios, there's this. There's only one president. I think when a, so I do think, I, I'm inclined to the view that Trump is more the chicken and you know, the, the rest of it wouldn't have as much of an impact if the president weren't echoing it or, or, or originating it in some cases. But, sir. How do you reconcile this being a choice if Biden doesn't get the nomination between Trump and somebody who is, you know, not center left but is radical left? And what do you, or what do you recommend people do? Because I know, you know, moderate Democrats will say that they'd prefer to support the president over Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. So I'm kind of curious, where do you come out on that? No, I mean, look, I have, <laughs> I have friends. I have many friends and colleagues in the sort of, let's say, non-Trump supporting Republican or conservative or centrist space uh, who are genuinely uh, uncertain about this. Some, I would say, and I'd be more inclined to this view myself, of the, you know, tr that a, some, I'd say, some would say a second term of Trump is more dangerous than a first term of even quite a liberal Democrat, even if you're a conservative. Whatever damage Elizabeth Warren's gonna do to, I don't know, the financial services and to people's taxes and, and expanding government in ways we don't like, that's pretty, I, that's more manageable than a second term of an emboldened President Trump, surely with a Republican majority in the Senate if he's reelected, feeling emboldened and, and the effects that would have on our constitutional system, our norms, on the international order. But other people would make the other argument, obviously, uh, and it's not a ridiculous argument at all, um, and a lot depends on how you weigh sort of some of the damage or effects of what Trump is and isn't doing. If you just say, well, no, come on, that's just tweets and rhetoric. Most of the 
policies are kind of, you know, would you cut through it all and don't worry too much about the hurricane not hitting Alabama at the end of the day, the policies are not so crazy and they could be more damaging uh, from, you know, Bernie Sanders or something. I, I think that would be true. That's, that's, uh, for me, this is the poignancy of the moment and the difficulty of the moment. Uh, I gave a talk at Columbia in the uh, spring, I guess, and uh, I explained why I wasn't for Trump and what I hoped might, how things might change. And, but it wasn't you know, a hortatory talk. It was just more analytical about the current moment. And at the end of it, uh, yeah, a very nice uh, a young man came up to me, student, and said, I, you know, I hope we can get out of this situation. I hope there's a way forward. Uh, I, I don't, I'm interested in politics, but I really don't want to live in a political system and a political situation where my choice is between a nativist party and a socialist party. And leaving aside the exaggeration and whether those things are exactly the same I, or similar, uh, uh, it is, I think it was a, for me it was kind of a poignant moment. I mean, what are the great, you know, Amer what, what social scientists have analyzed as American exceptionalism, maybe we're very lucky about this, I don't know how much credit we deserve, is we've mostly avoided the extremes of left and right by contrast with Europe we've had. Plenty of not so great presidents, plenty of foolish policies, plenty of mistakes, but at the end of the day, we had sort of a center left party and a center right party and the basic boundaries held, which they didn't obviously in much of the rest of the world in the 20th century. And what most worries me about this moment is you do get a sort of a nativist, somewhat authoritarian, uh, a populist right-wing party and a, I don't know if socialist is really the right word, but a the party that goes further and further on the left away from constitutional norms of limited government there too, and suddenly no one is really in favor of the more traditional American centrist uh, way of uh, politics, which has served us pretty well. So I, I think it's a genuine, 2020 could be a difficult choice for a lot of people, and uh, people are gonna have to make up their minds on that, I think. Speaking of difficult choices, uh, one of your colleagues on the Davidson faculty asked me to ask you this. So there's three Republicans uh, running against Trump. You've, I think, backed one of them. The question is now that there's a third, will you reconsider that? No, I, I mean, I, I guess I was quoted a little more when Walsh uh, launched than Weld, but I've, I've given modest contributions to all three. I'm for, I'm for all of them. I think each, honestly, I think each of them, none of them is probably gonna be president, but each of them embodies a certain aspects of a Republican party that I would prefer. To Trump, I mean, Weld, I think, was a more moderate and liberal than most Republicans, but a good governor of Massachusetts and a serious guy in his own aristocratic uh, New England way. Uh, Sanford has one or two slight midlife crisis there, and, uh, <laughs> but a serious congressman and a decent governor and, uh, you know, a real limited government Republican who cares about debt and deficit. Walsh, I mean, the most problematic of the three, I think it's fair to say, given that he was a kind of somewhat incendiary and irresponsible, really, talk radio guy for several years. But he was a congressman for a term, and he has apologized for the things he said, which is something that the president hasn't done. And I think, he gen I think that's genuine, and, and he really got caught up in a certain kind of mood. He says, I'm partly responsible for Trump. I don't know that he was that important a part of, of what led to Trump. But the Freedom Caucus, the kind of embrace of a certain kind of extreme rhetoric and conspiracy theorizing, uh, I think he really does regret, and he's publicly apologized for it. And from a tactical point of view, Walsh voted, he's, well, he's the only one of them who, who supported Trump in 2016, says he voted for him, and therefore he has a certain credibility, and I think it's uh, honest credibility, when he says, look, I, unlike Crystal, unlike Weld, unlike all these people who never liked Trump, I, I wished him well, I supported him, I voted for him, but I just don't think we can go on this way. I mean, that's what, what, well, what, what, what uh, Joe Walsh says. So there are three of them who are in. Maybe I see Carly Fiorina tweeted something today that was everyone took to be suggestive. Maybe more people will get in. Maybe the dam will break and uh, people will decide the Republican Party can do better. And, and if Trump doesn't succeed in shutting down all the primaries by, by, uh, by, by, by next year, maybe voters will even have a chance to, to weigh in on that. Good. Okay. Hi, I'm Lizzie. I'm a sophomore. This is for Mr. Allen. Um, your business model is smart brevity, as you talked about earlier. Um, the purpose of that being to lower costs for readers. You know, you talked about your daily news, morning newsletter being very brief because people don't have time to spend a lot of time, again, reading the news. I'm curious to know if Axios, as an organization, you actively work 
to target people um, like you know a single mother who has two kids working two jobs who really doesn't have the time or resources to spend um, extensively reading the news and you know learning about different political candidates. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question, and smart brevity fits into that audience first the idea that if you are that single mom and you are a curious person who does uh, want to remain engaged in the world, like what's an efficient way for you to do that? And so th that mindset goes into uh, how we develop um, uh, the different manifestations of smart brevity. So we have a podcast that's 10 minutes and it's awesome. And the um, on Axios.com, every story, one iPhone screen, you can always uh, go deeper, you can always get more, but you can catch up quickly. And the way, Lizzie, right? The way that that arose was as we traveled the country talking to people about what was missing in the media space. The two things that we heard a lot of were one, just the fire hose, right? Too much. But then the other one was, and you even heard this in academia, if I put something aside to read later, I never do. So it's for that exact reader that you're talking about. Anybody who cares about the world, is involved in the world, wants to understand the trends that are about to hit us, wants to understand how media tech, business, politics, science fit together, Axios is for that. Let me just add a word on that. That was, I, and maybe this will be an upbeat ending in a way. I think the internet makes possible this amazing uh, achievement that Axios has, has, has done and, and smart brevity. It also makes possible smart longevity, you know, in, in articles. My father edited a magazine called The Public Interest. It was 20, 25 page articles on public policy by James Q. Wilson and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, people like that, some political philosophy on uh, the founding fathers. Uh, it had a circulation, usually 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 readers. You could get it in libraries. It was, people saved it. It had an outsized impact because those readers were, you know, uh, important academics and uh, journalists and public figures, but still that was the readership. Uh, the public interest clo uh, folded. My father uh, was, was elderly and didn't want to do it anymore, and the foundations that backed it sort of thought it was out of date. So Yuval Levin, whom Mike knows, who's now at the American Enterprise Institute, a much younger scholar, started a successor to the public interest called National Affairs in 2009, and it's just about 10 years old, actually. Um, and National, very similar magazine, four, five, six, six thousand world art word articles, some of them kind of very current, you know, the new media, what do we have to think of it? Some of them, you know, federal housing policy and, you know, ways to improve, you know, a lot of pretty in the weeds, public policy articles and so forth. Um, those articles are getting much more readership than anything the public interest got. Why? Because it's a quarterly and they go online and they sit there for three months. They actually sit there forever because that's what the internet allows, which means that, and this has literally happened, an article gets published. It has also subscribers, about 5,000, like the public interest. A lot of, most of them presumably read the piece shortly after it comes out, after they get their magazine in the mail or they get a notification that it's up online. But then, I don't know, uh, George Will will cite one of the articles two months later or a politician will come across it and base his new proposal to, uh, for a family tax credit on something in national affairs two years ago, and he'll mention it in his speech, and suddenly the article gets, it's right there, and it gets read by you know, 20,000 or 100,000 people. Uh, whereas in the old days, if someone cited an article of the public interest from two years before, maybe you had your old issue, maybe you could find it somewhere in a library, you could write, I guess, to the public interest and buy it for, you know, four ninety five. It wasn't so easy. So there is a way in which the internet is a very double-edged sword and it makes possible all kinds of things, some of which are not, uh, are more encouraging if you sort of want to think that people shouldn't only have short brevity, they should also have the opportunity to read things that are longer and read things that are older and the amount of material you can get now that was used to, you know, it's, I always find it very hard to convey to students when I teach what it was like to be a student <laughs> before the internet really. Yeah, I mean, this stuff was hard to get. You know, you went to the library and you looked for hours and you couldn't find it and the book was gone, was taken out and that was the only place that the article existed and you know, the teacher didn't put it on reserve correctly, so it was like- Before he gets on microfiche. <laughs> that, was, that was fun, the microfiche. 
I won't go on in this way, but I, I, having, we were kind of downbeat for most of this, and I do want to say there are amazing educational opportunities, which means there are amazing civic opportunities to this incredible access we all have to knowledge and information. The question is whether we take advantage of that access sort of faster than we get swamped by all the uh, problems of the, of the new technology as well. No, and sharing the optimistic note and what Axios goes for is short, not shallow. And so the higher purpose is, can we help smart, curious people who care about the world make better decisions in their life and work? And that's the promise of technology and of our time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Will. Thank, Thank you, Davidson. Great job. Thank you both again for coming out. We really appreciate it. I think we'll all read our morning news tomorrow with maybe a little bit more thought, maybe a little bit of worry, but perhaps we can worry constructively now. So thank you both for coming to Davidson. You're very welcome here. Thank you, and read the Davidsonian. Yes, read the Davidsonian. We, our first issue comes out on Wednesday, so look out for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>